I thought the CRT was DAG coated because it's so it's so rough and thick with <laughs> the dirt. Uh, but I took a closer look and no, it's just glass. <laughs> it's just really, really, really dirty glass. And underneath that is the original Dumont label. A bit faded, but it is a 12 QP4. Hey guys, hot on the heels of the Zenith porthole. I'm starting on the next project, uh, the Dumont. Um, I showed back when I got this batch of sets almost a year ago. I'm really hoping to get this done in four weeks. Um, and uh, this weekend I've kind of cleared my schedule, so I'm hoping to get the, the major recapping done this weekend. I stayed up late last night and did an uh, initial look over the chassis and recorded some footage, but I was kind of rambling and I realized I misspoke more than once, so I'm sort of re-recording it. I may include some of that footage. One of the things I got wrong was I said I never worked on a Dumont before. That's not true. I did restore a couple of Dumont RA113s for a customer years ago, but those were newer sets, rectangular sets. This is one of the earliest. This was the RA103. Uh, D, it's the fourth and last revision of it. This is what was used um, more commonly seen in the Dumont Doghouse. I think that was their first tabletop. The RA-101 was, I think, used in gigantic uh, console and custom installations, and the RA-102, that's what's in my Dumont Clifton. So it's, it's early, and it is crusty, <laughs> literally and figuratively. Uh, 30 tubes in this guy, huge power transformer. It's dirty. It apparently was sitting in the basement of a uh, repair shop or something for years. Uh, a little bit of critter activity. has been some work done on it. There's some disconnected wires. Uh, I got my work cut out for me, so I want to get good service info. I have the service info Dumont published. It's in a large form factor, but really it's just a compendium of schematics and alignment instructions for all their sets. No parts list, no parts locator, no troubleshooting guide. But the SAMS is pretty good, and it's been scanned and available online. And I rushed uh, to print that out last night, and it's basically illegible. I think my, to my printer finally needs to do toner cartridge. So this morning I got up and was anxious to get going with this, so I just hopped onto eBay and ordered up a copy for six bucks plus shipping. Then I remembered, I'm pretty sure I have a copy of the SAMS already, and yeah, I think I actually have two copies. I think one might have even come with this. But this is the price you pay for being disorganized. I don't know where the heck I, I put them. I know I was going through a bunch of boxes of SAMS and I pulled out ones for upcoming projects. But I don't know where I put them. But I went back into the box and found a second copy of it, so... It was pristine, still in the folder from Sam's that had never been taken out, so we have this. This is pretty critical because it has the great parts locator that Sam's would do, where they would call out all the parts and put an arrow pointing to them. You can match up with the parts list. Very handy when somebody was working on it and you're not sure what's original and what isn't. All right. Uh, a while ago, I ordered up all the resi uh, sorry, all the capacitors I thought I would need. Certainly, all the electrolytics. Uh, I think I, I certainly have all the tubes. Probably all the resistors. So, um, let's get to it. Um, so, where to start? Uh, I already checked this out, um, but to be honest, I can't remember how the picture tube tested. <laughs> so I'll check that again. I think it's a 12 QP4. It's an oddball. Dumont was a pioneer in pitcher tubes. And uh, generally, at any given time, they had the largest, um, soonest. So this is a 12 inch set, but it came out, I think, 47, something like that. Uh, and they made their own, they designed their own, they did things their own way. So, it has a non-standard high voltage anode connection. Not, not totally unheard of, I've seen these in scope CRTs for sure. It's a little snap-on button thingy. Um, and it's shorter than a standard 12 inch, say a 12 LP4, it's far more common, that's what everybody else was using. 
they had a 12 QP4. Uh, and it has an ion trap on it, that's good, because there's a version, I think it's a 12 JP4, that they use on some of the really early sets. It didn't have an ion trap magnet. I have one of those in my Stromberg Carlson, I think it's a TV12. I did a video on it a million years ago. Uh, it's got a nice brown spot, uh, about two inches diameter, right in the middle of the screen. Uh, I think they were rushing to get these to markets, or I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what their thinking was, whether they didn't have an ion trap in it. Um, they, were, they were looking to, uh, I figured, yeah, there's not much, no, no programming, people are going to watch it a couple hours a week. It'll take ages for that brown spot to show up. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but this has an ion trap on it, so we're good there. But if it's bad, uh, I don't have any of these. I have to use an LP4. And it would, they're like an inch and a half longer, so let's hope this is good. Okay, but what else? Man, um, so this thing is a monster. It has a massive power transformer. Probably the highest wattage set I've, I've worked on to date. Dual 5U4 rectifiers. It's got an iTube, it's got an, a con continuous tuner, and duct tuner. Um, Interesting power supply. It has a delay relay that I think allows um, the tubes to warm up before it applies B plus to them. I think that's the, the idea there. It has this bizarre riser contraption here. I think we're missing a couple tubes out of it. There's a transformer on the side. There's a long skinny cap inside this thing. I don't recall exactly what this is all about. Oh man. The way the FCC allocated bandwidth uh, resulted in the FM band being right after channel 6 on TV. So if you make a tuner that just continuously scans like a scanner over a range of frequencies, you go 2 through 6 and you hit the FM band and there's a bit of a gap and then you pick up a channel 7 around 175 megahertz or something like that. Um, so this, this is a radio too. Uh, we'll find out as we go if this is smart enough to when you get past channel 6. There's, there's some gears back here. It might uh, turn the CRT off. And it's a gap from 108 megahertz to around 170 or so. How do they bridge that? Otherwise you'd be turning and turning and turning and turning. It was completely linear. So that'll be interesting to see how that goes too. Um, So I could just start recapping. Uh, this thing is filthy, so I, I definitely want to do some cleaning on it. Uh, I could just turn it on. I don't think that's too wise. Uh, we do have one issue in that regard. I don't have the speaker, and the owner can't find the speaker. Um, and I think I have to look. I hope it's not a field coil speaker. In which case. We may need to rig up a power resistor or something if that field coil is part of the power supply like you'd see in a radio. Because we, we definitely have more than two wires. Most TVs use a permanent magnet speak, uh, speaker, but this there's more going on. We have four wires, three wires in ground. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Now, it could just be that the, this goes to the output transformer that's mounted on the speaker frame. I hope that's the case, in which case we can proceed without the speaker. Um, there's that cap I was talking about in that side, that riser. That is bizarre. Whew, and I say it's it's filthy. Um, I'll tell you one thing. Let's let's do right now. I'm going to clean this up a little bit, and then I want to pop the cover off of this and make sure that ceramic uh, shaft isn't broken. And uh, show you what the inductors uh, look like. And uh, assuming it's not broken, do a little bit of cleaning and lubrication because I do not want it to snap. Well, this is annoying. You can get several screws across the top, but there are a couple on the side that you absolutely cannot get to because of this transformer, that transformer, and the CRT itself. So I can't get it off. That's disassembling a considerable amount of stuff, but we can pry it up a bit. And uh, I can peer in there, maybe hopefully you can too. Should I get a good angle and zoom in? Uh, I was 
goes off a bit. This is the earlier type. It has three roller inductors. So there's a spiral. Uh, well, these are these turns. It's an inductor. It's a, it's a coil of wire on a insulating form. There is a uh, a contact on that coil that can on a track that can go back and forth. So as you turn this. Uh, the inductance changes, like it's in an old time transformer. And the uh, good news is the shaft is not broken, so you're good to go in that regard. I'd still like to get this disassembled, both for cleaning, and I'd like to put some fresh grease down in there, but uh, not sure to do it. Uh, you know, actually, the gears are all really filthy too. I suppose I'm just going to have to bite the bullet and take this whole thing off which I don't think is all that bad because this was made by a, uh, a separate company, Mallory, and sold as a unit. So I think there's only, uh, there's probably a filament supply, uh, RFN and, uh, and uh, IF out, and B+. Plus. Uh, and it's probably got a few mounting screws, so it might not be, actually be all that hard to just take this whole thing off. Um, Alright, so let's... Put that aside for the moment, and uh, let's take a fresh look underneath the chassis. Here's the underside of the chassis, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty monstrous. And I'm also very glad I didn't just turn it on or attempt to power it up because we have some loose wires uh, and a loose capacitor, and well. <laughs> Looks like somebody was maybe trying to fix something down here and uh, didn't. That's why you check sets out before you just plug them in. Um, and that's what I mean by checking it out, is looking for stuff like this. It's obviously a trouble sign. We're going to have to review the service info and figure out what this is supposed to go to. Now that's one thing that's good in our favor. Is there's extensive service info for this, both from Dumont and Ryder Sam. So uh, that we should be pretty well covered. And... I'm hardly the first person to work on an RA-103 chassis, so there are a number of write-ups online and uh, other folks I can consult with. Uh, some other quick things I noticed. Um, a couple of giant candom resistors. <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully they're still good, and then we'll have to think about, once I get the set working, if they're still good, do I want to replace them? Because... Uh, can be problematic. Um, this guy's definitely problematic. Uh, you see these a lot in early, early black and white TVs in the damper circuit. A big old power resistor. Um, man, um, back when I was working on a lot of Admiral TVs, maybe 10 years ago, <laughs> um, I was trying to find a good one of these. I think I went through six chassis and all six were bad. Uh, so, and the, you can see the enamel coating's gone down here is a real common failure point, so we'll probably need to replace this. Look, they still make very similar vitreous enamel coated power resistors that you mount in the same way with a mica washer on one end and a screw down the middle. Uh, capacitors, electrolytic to be specific. The two giant ones down here that go right through the chassis. What's interesting is they're just single section caps. So uh, I thought they'd be four section, and I have to think about mounting an adapter cap or terminal strips or restuffing them or something. But they're just this is just two caps, and the modern ones, of course, are going to be something like this big. So <laughs> um, I'll see. I'll, I'll have to kind of map out where I want to put them. This has a lot of electrolytics, but um, a lot of them are single axial mounted. Uh, electrolytic, electrolytic, 2,000 microfarad, 6 volt. Uh, and same with that, electrolytic, electrolytic, uh, and so on. So there actually aren't that many multi-section can uh, type caps in this, which is good. Tube, what's well, a tube doing down under here in the middle of the chassis, 6AL5? I think that is the time delay tube that controls the relay I mentioned. When you turn the set on, just like with some high-end stereo systems, when you turn on the amplifier, you hear a click after a bit of time. Same idea. You let things stabilize before you apply power to the whole set. The relay is actually way up here. 
And of course we want to hope that that is still good. Just the usual, there's paper caps, uh, check the resistors, uh, and what I'm hoping is that as I go, the more I do, the easier it's going to be. The reason I say that is I'm not going to restuff these caps, the newer caps are much smaller, there's a huge chassis, things are spread out, as I replace each of these with a much smaller part, it's going to open up things more and more and more, and it'll be easier to see what's going on. The purists might not like that, but hey, for these complicated sets when there's a lot going on, I like putting in new smaller parts so you can really see sometimes the circuit's buried two, three layers deep, you can't see all the wiring, you could have problems that you can't see because it's being hidden behind a giant part. The new part that I replace this with is going to be probably something like that or even smaller. It'll just open all this up and then we can see what's going on about terminal strips if we need to and, and so on. These aren't super rare or any, by any means. Yeah, that's nice high-end, but a lot of sets used the, were made with the RA-103. Um, yeah, well, at least one control that's been replaced. While I was recording, uh, my memory card filled up and uh, the camera cut out. Maybe that's a sign that I should stop talking and start working. So I'm going to continue cleaning things up. Uh, I'm going to get service info um, and uh, just get to it. A picture, as they say, is worth a thousand words, you know. Some people rag on Sam's photo fact for their occasional mistakes and yeah they do occasionally but this is so handy it's a photograph of an original chassis with all the parts called out so when you encounter a set that's been worked on modified and you get uh, a little lost uh, this is really handy so we can compare this to this now, what doesn't belong <laughs> I thought it looked a little odd in there, but I've seen them before in sets of this vintage, so it didn't throw me off that much. But no, it's not supposed to be there. What is it going to? It's going to this mess. Um, which, <laughs> uh, I think somebody just tried to twist wires around and didn't have a soldering iron because none of, this, none of these connections are, are soldered. They're just twisted together and they're all falling apart. So, I believe, based on some simple testing and tracing the wires out, is that this large wire-wound rheostat is the focus control. It's open. It's corroded. Uh, it doesn't turn very well. Uh, maybe it can be repaired, but for now, it's open, and they tried to replace it with this. Wouldn't have been variable, but at least it would have... Um, gotten power going through the focus coil and the power supply because it is part of the power supply and in addition to uh, um, focusing the electron beam on the CRT it's here um, this power supply is convoluted to say the least so it's not at all obvious looking at it here how the heck it's connected to the power here's your main power supply and it goes off that way to the right. And the only thing coupling it is that little cap there, which is the paper cap we have here. But if you go over all the way to the other side of the schematic, we have these centering controls. Uh, centering controls are a really, really nifty thing to have on a set, but it makes the power supplies really convoluted. Concept is simple. 
we have electromagnets around the neck of the CRT that do horizontal and vertical deflection. These centering controls put a small DC bias on those electromagnets which causes the whole image to shift left right or up and down. But to do that you need a small amount of voltage and the way they do that is they tap into the power supply so uh, you need some big power resistors <laughs> and typically the center tap of the power transformer uh, does not get grounded uh, boy, it's hard to even say how they have it hooked up in this. Looks like the center tap is grounded, which means they have them hooked in somewhere else. Uh, anyway. Anyway, oh yeah, and then, then listen to the lovely convention. These are electrolytic caps. 1.5 ohms at 120 hertz. That means the reactants at a frequency of 120 hertz should be 1.5 ohms. You can look up a reactance formula and you can figure that out. There's some online calculators, but these caps are printed. That's one of them. That's the other one. I think they're both 2,000 microfarad. Uh, at any rate, um, I've read some uh, online uh, restorations of this chassis, and I've seen others um, having to deal with this. It's, it's a, not an uncommon failure point just like that relay up there. That relay up there we can see down here. So this is your main supply of the two 5U4s in parallel and here's a relay that delays power going to the set. And here's those two electrolytics, the one section caps. These two giant guys coming down here. Well, those are two 80 microfarad 450 volt caps. They put them in series with equalization resistors. What this does is you, when you put caps in series, you have the capacitance, but you double the voltage. So this will, the equivalent is a 40 microfarad 900 volt capacitor. A little overkill since B plus at this point is around 450 volts, but that's Dumont for you. Nowadays you can get a 600 volt cap, so I think you could probably get away with just replacing this whole thing with a 40 microfarad 600 volt cap um, but uh, since they did it this way I'll replicate the same thing but that's what that's all about that was one of the power supplies we've also got uh, a couple 6x4 bias rectifiers uh, negative supply actually those might go to those centering controls now that I think about it so we do have a negative supply rail in this set and there's yet another rectifier that's the time delay so that 6AL5 uh, is what powers that relay so the relay won't kick on until this tube is warmed up that's the way that works um, but my relay appears to be forced so it looks like somebody f attempted to repair an open rheostat and a non-functioning relay uh, and they just I think this got bent I got to look for a photo of an undamaged relay but I think this piece of metal <laughs> it's not supposed to be shaped like that and they, they twisted it which just shoved the contacts together they're they're, they're uh, they don't move <laughs> like they're supposed to aside from that I think everything else is original more, well, I think these two caps have been replaced, but I think the rest of this is uh, basically original. Even some of this odd-looking stuff where you might see a couple resistors in parallel, I think that's original. Oh, so, uh, actually, no, this this I think is also another old repair, but I'm not 100% on. It just it looks crudely done or a little loose, and I see a clipped-off lead. Um, but I'm hoping that those are the only two major things we have to deal with. So uh, this is why I wanted to take a look at this set ASAP. I'm going to get it up here is to identify parts I need to track down. So I need to find a relay and a rheostat. I might have one. I certainly have some that look like this. I need to look up the value. Here's a little update for you. Uh, 25 watt rheostats are not easy to come by and tend to be quite expensive. 
upwards of a hundred bucks. Uh, and most you can get from DigiKey Mauser, or maybe all of them, have short shafts. We need one that's like a good inch and a half long. Surplus Sales in Nebraska used to have one of that, so I've used in the past. Uh, they're out of stock. So I went on to eBay and hunted around, and I found a guy. He had one left, and I ordered it. Uh, I was was shipping twenty bucks, I think, but it's one point five k. It's not one k. Uh, that was a fairly high failure rate part in these Dumonts. Uh, I'm not saying the world supply was taken up by people restoring Dumonts, but uh, I know various people have posted uh, in the restoration diaries, they all got a surplus sales in Nebraska, so, well, that may be why that's why the supply dried up. So, 1.5, yeah, it's 50% higher than what was originally there, but I'm hoping we can work around that. Uh, we can put a shunt across it to lower the resistance on the outside legs. Uh, I don't think it's super picky anyways about the value, so we'll, we'll get it working. Uh, now this tube, I was, I was dead wrong about this. Oh, uh, we'll give it to Dumont to do more goofiness. Uh, that's not the 6AL5 for the delay relay, that's top side. This is a video detector. And, uh... I guess they put it down under here for shielding and to keep it close to where it's used. I think that's the final IF transformer that feeds right into, into, the, 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 into the detector. Now notice this bit of insulated wire here. You do not want to mess with this. This is a gimmick. If you look carefully, it's two pieces of wire. One, and it's going here, one here, and it loops up. But one of the wires is just cut off, and then the other one continues on to this coil. That's a capacitor. That's the coupling capacitor for the video detector. Rather than using one of these nice tubular ceramic or a mica cap, they chose to just select a length of wire that has the few picofarad value that they needed. So, just leave it alone, but that, that is a video detector down here. I have been continuing to work a little bit up in here, getting more of a feel for the set, and I'm liking what I'm seeing. Something bad happened down here. Not only was it monkey business and repair attempts, but there's residue on the side of the chassis down here. Something went up in smoke. The rheostat doesn't particularly look charred, but maybe the wax cap I found down here wasn't the original, and the original went up in smoke. Maybe you started a little fire down here. Because otherwise, I don't know where that would have come from. These uh, appear to be okay, but they're a bit off in value. It's stamped on here, a little hard to see, but it says 250 ohm, 200 ohm, uh, 7,000, I think, and 2,500, 25,000, something like that. These measure a bit higher than that. Like this is maybe more like 250. Uh, this 275, something like that. These are wire wound. They don't change in value over time, so I'm not quite sure why the value's off a bit. But we'll go with them for now. Uh, if I need to, I'll remove them and I'll get some modern chassis mount, uh, aluminum house, power resistor. I'll have to drill some holes in here, but uh, I can mount them here easily enough. That's plenty of room. That will not be difficult at all. Now, I was thinking... I should probably not be so cocky about the rest of this set. Uh, I've been very lucky in my projects. I haven't encountered, encountered a bad power transformer, but there's always a first. And that charring down here got me thinking, maybe I should check the power transformer before I go nuts with recapping. So, um, I want to plug the set in, but in a very controlled manner. In particular, I want to pull all the rectifier tubes out so that there's nothing drawing any power except tube filaments. So pop out the 5U4s, uh, the 6X4s, and I think that'll do it. Yeah. So we'll just have uh, tube filament glowage. This is a hefty part from Notice there's a 5 amp fuse on this set. It's 30 tubes. This thing, <laughs> I don't know, if the, well let's see the wattage should be here on the front of this. 
Uh, where are we at? Uh, well, it draws 2.8 amps, apparently. All right. <laughs> Quite a bit for a tabletop set. Uh, and one final thing. Up in here we have some mica mold caps. Uh, they look like giant mica uh, capacitors. Those are across the line going to, or sorry, one on each leg of the AC line uh, going to the, the chassis. These guys, these .05s, those could pop. The set doesn't isn't grounded, so essentially those are those are across the line. Just think of it as one capacitor across the line, the equivalent circuit. I don't want those to pop. They are not at all critical for powering up the set or anything like that. They're to filter noise off the line, so I'm just going to clip them out. But I will replace them eventually with Type Y capacitors. So between pulling the rectifiers and clipping those out, we should be able to turn this on safely, and then we can check to see do all the tubes light up, the remaining tubes in the set, in which case we know the filament windings are good, and I can stick an AC meter down into the tube sockets. So check pins 4 and 6 on the 5U4, and uh, let's see, do the 6X4s just tap into the same windings as these guys? No. Uh, I could do something similar in the 6X4s. Uh, maybe between uh, the two pin 7s. What should the AC voltage be? It's not marked on here, but uh, six, 700 volts AC, something like that. Okay, I threw a knob on from the junk box for the power volume. The mode switch, uh, by the way, does have a TV and a radio mode. When you're in radio mode, it does cut juice to some of the TV tubes. Um, I have a ammeter on the 1.5 amp scale. Pulled out the two 5U4s. The 6X4s are the two missing tubes on this riser. The mounted horizontally stick out the back. And this is a filter choke and this is a filter cap. This is all for a negative supply rail. It's like a negative, it's not like, it is a self-contained power supply that's attached to the top of the chassis, which makes me wonder, was this not present in earlier revisions of this chassis? And this was added on later. I'll have to check out the service info uh, from the older revisions to see. All right, here we go. We have a dial lamp. <laughs> its twin is uh, out. Uh, we're drawing... 0.8 amps seems reasonable. Even there aren't all that many tubes. Well, four rectifiers are out and they draw quite a bit of current. At least the two 5U4s do, and the pitch tube is disconnected as well. Even there aren't that many tubes left drawing current. And yeah, they, they're all filthy, but the ones I can see are glowing. All right, let's check that AC voltage. Let's see, what did I say? Four and four and six. So all I do is one, two, three, four, and six. Eight hundred and fourteen volts. And it's in parallel, so I assume that's the same. So I think we're good. Uh, if I really wanted to test this, I would leave this on for a while and see if the power transformer gets warm or see if uh, any of the voltages drop. Well, that's a good sign. It's, it's not humming. It's not, it's not warm. Things seem to be holding steady. I know I do not. This thing's probably rated for twice the wattage they need in this set or something crazy like that. All right, cool. I mean, the power switch works. These controls are a bit crusty, a bit filthy. Um, just especially the mode switch uh, definitely all needs a good cleaning. All right, well, I need to get back to work.